Hi, good afternoon. Um, we're going to begin our talk, uh, which is building a collection. I'm Brett Lippman. I'm the director of the Drawing Center in New York City. And ironically, um, the Drawing Center does not have a collection. Uh, so we act as a Kunsthalle, meaning that we make exhibitions uh, without the basis of a collection. However, I have worked on building a collection with another institution, which is what I will present uh, at the end of this talk. Uh, but today I have some esteemed uh, guests and panelists, uh, Dr. Philippe Cohn, uh, who I met uh, through the pre Canson Prize a couple of years ago and had some interesting conversations with in Barcelona. And I wanted to invite him from the perspective of a personal collection uh, to discuss how he's built a collection which is not specifically drawing, um, but in which he uses drawing as a link between different mediums and maybe even between artists. Uh, my colleague uh, in New York, Isabel Dervaux, at the Morgan uh, Library and Museum. Uh, Isabel and I see each other often and uh, at, at various events around the city and surely um, go to see each other's exhibitions. The Morgan, uh, an institution that is uh, very, very, very well known for, of course, its library and its collection of old master works, um, also has been building over the years a collection of modern and contemporary works. And Isabel has been really spearheading um, the efforts uh, for the museum around those kinds of issues and also making the exhibitions uh, with modern and contemporary. Uh, the, and I, I will finish the discussion with um, the project that I did with Middlesbrough MIMA in the UK uh, with Gavin Delahunty, uh, a collection that was supported by the Art Fund in the UK, and I'll talk a little bit about how we did that. So we're going to start with uh, Dr. Cohn, and he's going to do his presentation in French. So if you would like to listen to it in English, uh, please go to channel two on your headphones. Otherwise, if you speak French, you'll be able to perfectly understand. Thank you. Bonjour. Bonjour. Bon, alors, alors ex, euh, Brett m'a autorisé, euh, c'est vrai, je devais faire cette, euh, cette présentation en anglais initialement. Et puis, euh, évidemment, comme euh, je n'ai pas l'habitude comme des professionnels de, de m'exprimer sur le sujet, j'ai demandé l'autorisation de le faire en français. Donc, pour ceux qui, qui sont anglo-saxons, euh, mettez vos casques comme ça, ça. Voilà. Euh, donc. Euh, Merci, Brett, de, de m'avoir invité. On, effectivement, on s'est connu il y a deux ou trois ans lors d'un jury du prix Canson et on a eu l'occasion de parler de beaucoup de pas mal d'artistes qu'on avait en commun. Donc, euh, euh, je voudrais euh, tout d'abord euh, vous faire une première présentation. Là, de, 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 ma collection donc, a été montrée, ma collection dans sa globalité a été montrée entre 2013 et 2014. Donc euh, à Tel Aviv, à Paris, puis à Moscou. Donc à Tel Aviv, bon, vous savez, pour ceux qui ne le savent pas, maintenant je je, veux, je vis à Tel Aviv et elle a été euh, donc le curateur, le commissaire d'expo était Ami Barak, qui est un ami de longue date, qui connaissait très bien ma collection et et ça a été pour moi, comme beaucoup de collectionneurs qui confient comme ça. Euh, euh, leur collection à un commissaire d'expo ou à un conservateur de musée. Euh, J'entendais euh, ce matin les Guerlains euh, parler également de ça. Ça a été l'occasion de, de chapitrer, de mettre un peu au clair, parce que nous-mêmes, on collectionne euh, un petit peu comme ça, de manière impulsive, euh, pendant, pendant plus de 20 ans. Euh, alors, on a, on a des chemins, mais ce n'est pas toujours euh, très clair dans notre tête. Next. Alors, euh, ce que je voulais dire, évidemment, c'est qu'on est dans un salon du dessin, on est dans un, un symposium sur le dessin contemporain et que euh, moi, je suis confronté, en rencontrant beaucoup de collectionneurs, toujours à, à ce... Bon, pas tous les collectionneurs sont malheureusement intéressés par les œuvres sur papier, les dessins ou ce que j'appelle aussi les petits formats. Alors, bien sûr, dans ma collection aussi, il y a des œuvres important des installations, il y a beaucoup d'art vidéo, de la photographie, comme cette installation de, de Paul McCarthy. Next. Également, euh, 
donc ce double portrait de Cindy Sherman et Richard Prince qui est, qui est très connu. Next. Voilà, une sculpture de Matthew D. Jackson. Next. Et puis un, un artiste plus jeune comme Dan Vo, euh, qui est euh, très collectionné euh, aussi bien par les collectionneurs privés que dans les musées. Next. Mais alors, l'essentiel ne peut pas, à mon, à mon sens, on ne peut pas faire une collection. Euh, euh, Aujourd'hui, euh, c'est vrai que d'un point de vue d'un collectionneur privé, le, le, le marché a une, une très grande influence et malheureusement, les collectionneurs doivent comprendre qu'une collection ne peut pas se bâtir exclusivement que sur des, des, œuvres, de, des œuvres importantes en termes de, de nom, en termes de reconnaissance du marché, mais également en termes de, de dimension. Et c'est souvent, euh, souvent les petits formats qui font parfois, euh, qui donnent parfois la compréhension, euh, l'intimité, euh, la connaissance euh, de ce que le collectionneur a, a, a dans sa tête. Donc en fait, je voudrais faire juste un remonter euh, 25 ans en arrière, parce qu'on me connaît plus par ma collection d'art contemporain et, et très peu par ce que j'ai pu collectionner avant. En particulier, il y a 25-30 ans, euh, j'étais euh, très intéressé par euh, une école, l'école du 19e, et, et Eugène Delacroix en particulier, étant né moi-même au Maroc. Donc euh, voilà, j'ai pu euh, apprécier euh, les œuvres orientalistes de cette époque. Et puis j'ai découvert comme ça euh, ce peintre qui est sûrement inconnu, qui est inconnu du grand public, qui est un peu connu euh, par ceux qui s'intéressent au 19e, qui est Alfred de Hodinck. Et ce qui avait d'intéressant, c'est qu'Alfred de Odin, qui, a, 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 qui est un suiveur de Delacroix, a, à la différence de Delacroix, passé beaucoup d'années au Maroc, et en particulier a dépeint la, la vie juive au Maroc. Donc euh, c'était intéressant pour moi, parce que je débutais une collection, et ça m'a permis de faire une recherche très approfondie. Et à ma connaissance, il n'y a, a pas dans le monde d'autres personnes que je connaisse qui aient pu euh, rassembler un nombre conséquent de dessins de cet artiste sur le même thème. Donc pendant 20-25 ans, j'ai fait les salles de l'hôtel Drouot, euh, euh, les antiquaires qui pouvaient en avoir, et puis très patiemment, j'ai reconstitué toutes les scènes à partir des dessins, des aquarelles, de dos dingue, des peintres, des peintures euh, qui traitaient du sujet de, du judaïsme marocain à cette époque. Donc après, un, après 25 ans, euh, j'avais fait un petit peu le tour et euh, voilà, donc j'ai offert cette collection au musée de Jérusalem maintenant il y a quelques années. Suivante. Juste pour vous dire que euh, euh, appréhender le dessin ancien, le dessin du 19e nécessite pour un collè collectionneur privé ou même pour euh, un conservateur de musée des recherches approfondie beaucoup plus que pour le dessin contemporain et, et euh, pour ceux qui n'ont pas eu encore la chance, même si ici on ne parle que de dessin contemporain, mais de passer comme je l'ai fait euh, des moments au cabinet des dessins du Louvre m'a énormément aidé à appréhender déjà cette période que j'aimais beaucoup, mais également je voulais dire que je pense que sans cette connaissance du dessin ancien, du dessin du 19e, je pense que j'aurais pas su appréhender euh, la collection de dessins contemporains aujourd'hui. Donc là, je vais montrer juste deux ou trois dessins en parallèle. Donc à droite, c'est un dessin dans la collection du Louvre. Et donc à gauche, un hein, des dessins que, que j'ai collectionné. Suivante. Là, c'est pareil. Donc à droite, vous avez une étude de, de mariée juive euh, euh, typique de Delacroix. Donc là, c'est de Odin, bien sûr. Et à gauche, on a... Euh, on a l'aquarelle de l'étude d'un fameux tableau qui s'appelle La fête juive à Tanger. Euh, voilà, suivante. Ok, donc après ce, ce passage un petit peu d'il y, y a 25 ans sur la première partie de ma collection, euh, euh, comme, euh, comme l'a dit Brett, euh, je fais surtout des liens entre les œuvres. C'est-à-dire que je ne vais pas acheter nécessairement un, un dessin parce que euh, par coup de cœur, mais aujourd'hui, si vous voulez, le, le dessin vient, vient être un, un liant à, à une œuvre passée. 
Donc là, par exemple, on, on fait des relations entre cette installation de Simon Fujiwara, qui est un, un, un autoportrait, qui est donc, un, comme vous le voyez, un miroir qui a été chiné, et diapo suivante, et l'œuvre d'Alexandre Singh, c'est ma rencontre avec Brett, justement, un artiste qu'on aime beaucoup, et, et il, il se trouvait que euh, Alexandre Singh avait dans cette série The Pledge fait plusieurs portraits de personnes, pas, pas nécessairement d'artistes, et que donc euh, là, il a fait le portrait de Simon Fujiwara. Et c'est cette connexion-là qui, euh, qui m'intéresse le plus. Alors évidemment, on n'est pas dans des petits formats, puisque on sait que Love the Pledge est une quarantaine de dessins à chaque fois. On a eu les portraits de Marc-Olivier Valère, entre autres, et d'autres personnes très connues du monde de l'art. Donc voilà. Euh, suivante. Alors, euh, voilà, je vous parlais de rapprochement et on va continuer, mais j'ai parlé aussi, pas de dessin, mais bien sûr, comme on le sait, enfin, on parle d'œuvres sur papier, on parle de petits formats, enfin, bon, j'ai pas de dénomination particulière, mais c'est vrai que ce, cette pièce à droite, pour moi, de Marcel Broutas, qui est une, pas une grande pièce en soi, mais qui est un, un, un élément majeur dans ma collection. Donc, c'est peu de gens, quand ils viennent chez moi, s'arrêtent dessus. Mais euh, pour moi, c'est une pièce très importante. Euh, et, euh, et puis plus tard, deux, trois ans après, ben, on rencontre une plus jeune artiste qui est Alicia Kvabé. Et donc, on fait ce lien entre une seconde d'éternité, les 24 images par seconde et la signature de l'artiste. Et puis, comme vous le voyez ici, c'est un petit collage de petites aiguilles de Kalissa Gvabé a, a fait. Suivante. Et puis, euh, pareil, donc, euh, toujours pareil, une, vous avez commencé à comprendre que je, Marcel Broutard, c'est important euh, pour moi dans, dans ma collection et, et je considère que cette lettre qui est, euh, qu'on peut qualifier d'œuvre sur papier ou de dessin, que certains d'entre vous connaissent, donc sur le département des aigles et, et la euh, donc euh, le, le musée fictif un petit peu que Marcel Brotard s'était créé et puis euh, on a la chance euh, de rencontrer euh, euh, une œuvre de, de Gérard Gazurowski et on sait que Gérard Gazurowski aussi dans une, une série bien connue a, a, a créé une, une université euh, de l'art où il y avait des artistes qui étaient souvent des artistes recalés et la chance est de tomber comme artiste recalé sur Marcel Broutard Satoide et vous remarquerez euh, la faute d'orthographe dans son nom. Suivante. Bon, bah, alors évidemment, on continue encore. Alors Hans Peter Feldman, c'est un print issu d'un dessin. Euh, on connaît un peu l'histoire de ses mains de Hans Peter Feldman en relation avec euh, euh, l'œuvre de Loris Gréau. Et bien évidemment, c'est Marcel Duchamp, cette fois-ci, qui est, qui, est, qui est à l'honneur entre les deux. Suivante. Et puis après, euh, le dessin, à l'inverse des œuvres plus importantes, euh, c'est aussi euh, les amitiés qu'on peut avoir avec les artistes. Donc ça, ça a été fondamental pour moi. Donc euh, en 20 ans, euh, bon, je fais partie des collectionneurs qui adorent rencontrer les artistes. Donc j'ai lié des liens très forts avec certains. Et euh, voilà, par exemple, ici, je me souviens que j'ai collectionné très tôt Douglas Gordon en 98 avec euh, des installations vidéo et une importante, euh, un text wall. Et euh, j'ai fait partie d'un groupe de 30 ou 40 personnes qui, un matin, ont reçu euh, euh, un courrier, je crois que ce qu'on appelle du mail art. Alors, est-ce que c'est est -ce est un dessin Est-ce que c'est une lettre Est-ce que c'est une œuvre sur papier je pense que c'est la, la même chose pour moi. Donc, euh, et euh, voilà, It's better not to know. Et quand on retournait l'œuvre, c'était It's better not to know. Plus, plus, plus intéressant, c'est ce dessin de Mircha Cantor à droite, où euh, Mircha Cantor, en 2004, était encore un artiste méconnu. Donc, j'ai. Euh, Jusqu'à l'année dernière, pour ceux qui ne le savent pas, j'étais chirurgien dentiste, donc j'ai eu l'occasion de soigner beaucoup d'artistes et donc de beaucoup parler avec... Des... <rire> je pense que les artistes, des fois, en avaient un petit peu marre parce que je parlais plus d'art avec eux que je ne les soignais. Mais bon, c'était très intéressant. Et, et à l'époque, Mircha, euh, 
quand il était sorti du cabinet, m'a dit qu'il n'avait pas du tout d'argent pour me payer. Que, voilà. Je lui ai dit, écoute, c'est pas grave, tu me payeras quand tu peux. Il m'a dit, écoute, je peux te faire cadeau d'une œuvre d'art. Je lui ai dit, écoute, il n'y a pas de problème. Puis la semaine d'après, il a, il a sonné à... Il va rappeler pour me dire qu'il aimerait bien m'offrir le cadeau. Encore une référence à Duchamp, l'incontournable Duchamp. Et vous voyez qu'il a repris l'idée du chèque de Duchamp à son médecin. À, à, à la différence, c'est qu'il a laissé sans ordre celui-là, parce qu'il ne savait peut-être pas qu'il serait un artiste plus connu aujourd'hui. Suivante. Et puis, euh, une, autre, une dernière histoire d'amitié qui, cette fois-ci, est vraiment beaucoup plus longue avec Philippe Parreno, dont je suis le travail depuis, euh, je pense, mes débuts de collectionneur. Et quand, euh, quand j'ai... Euh, Monté, enfin, quand la collection a été montrée, euh, très naturellement, j'ai demandé à, à Philippe Parreno d'écrire un petit texte. Et je savais que Philippe Parreno, chaque fois qu'un qu copain lui demandait d'écrire un texte, n'était jamais vraiment sur le sujet. Donc, je ne m'attendais pas de sa part à un texte sur la collection Philippe Cohen. Et puis, pareil, la semaine d'après, il, il vient me voir et il me dit, ben voilà mon texte. Donc, euh, ben, le texte, c'était deux dessins de Luciole, euh, euh, c'est Luciole en fait qui ne sont pas des œuvres qui sont commercialisées, c'est-à-dire qu'il ne les vend pas à travers les galeries, mais il les, il les réserve à, à ses amis, aux gens qui l'ont aidé, aux commissaires, aux conservateurs d'expo qui l'ont euh, depuis plusieurs années. Il en a fait une œuvre importante que vous avez peut-être vue, qui est maintenant un film d'animation. Donc ça, c'est les histoires d'amitié. Et c'est vrai que ces histoires d'amitié, j'en ai plein comme ça. Jean-Jacques Grulier, de beaucoup Marie-Ange Guillaumino, beaucoup, beaucoup, beaucoup d'artistes vous envoient parfois des, des lettres avec des dessins. Et, où, euh, et donc, c'est quelque chose d'incroyable. Et, et je pense que euh, vous ne verrez jamais ce type d'œuvre euh, avec des œuvres monumentales. Quoi. Enfin, je ne vois pas euh, euh, Cindy Sherman ni Jeff Koons me me faire une œuvre spécifique. Mais il n'y a qu'à travers, à vraiment à travers le dessin, où on arrive à rentrer dans cette intimité dont on parle tant par le dessin. Mais ça, c'est une, une intimité entre le collectionneur et l'artiste, comme entre l'artiste et puis les conservateurs de musées qui travaillent avec lui suivante. Alors, euh, comme a dit Brett, je n'aime pas trop qu'on me qualifie de collectionneur de dessins. Ce n'est pas vrai. En plus, c'est vrai qu'avec le temps, quand je regarde les quantités d'œuvres, ça représente 50% de la collection. Mais, euh, mais je ne cherche pas à faire une collection de dessins. Donc, par contre, comme je, comme je le disais, si on ne regarde pas les œuvres de petit format chez moi, œuvres sur papier, donc on les appelle comme on veut, on ne peut pas comprendre le sens de la collection. Donc c'est vrai que Ami Barak, en construisant le chapitrage du catalogue, a, a fait un dernier chapitre qu'il a appelé euh, le cabinet mémorable. Bon, moi, moi, je vais plutôt... On peut appeler ça cabinet dessin ou comme on veut. Et donc, selon le, 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 le pays où ça a été montré, donc à Tel Aviv, j'ai laissé à Ami Barak le soin de faire ce mur. Suivante. Alors, j'ai eu la chance d'avoir Bernard Blisten qui m'avait accompagné au vernissage de, de l'expo à Tel Aviv et qui, au moment de l'exposition à Paris au passage de Retz, m'a demandé de lui confier l'installation de, de ce mur, donc qui a été revu autrement. Et comme vous pouvez le voir, il y a un vrai mélange de petites vidéos, de dessins, de photos. Il y a même ce, la couleur du mur est donnée par, tout à fait à droite, une œuvre de Claude Ruto qui lui-même m'a autorisé à mélanger une œuvre où il est censé avoir que le, la peinture de la même couleur que le mur, m'a autorisé exceptionnellement à montrer ces petits formats avec des œuvres d'Alan McCollum. On voit ici même un autoportrait, un petit polaroïde d'Andy Warhol. Et, euh, et puis pas mal, quelques œuvres dont on a déjà parlé. Suivante. Et puis après, il y a dans le cadre privé, c'est-à-dire que là, maintenant, c'est chez moi à Tel Aviv. Donc, c'est vrai qu'avec le temps, bon, je me suis rendu compte qu'il y avait énormément de mains. 
Est-ce que... Bon, bah, c'est sûrement... Voilà, c'est toujours pareil. La main de l'artiste, la évidemment, mais sûrement parce que le dessin est quelque chose d'important. Mais là, c'est pareil. La main, mais avec d'autres médiums. Donc, je me suis permis de mélanger les photos de Danvo avec une œuvre d'Annette Messager, une vidéo de Gary Hill, euh, des mains... Des mains... Euh, des mains de, des mains de, qui sont des lampes des su, de suspension de synagogue, et même un néon de Jonathan Monk en haut à droite. Suivante. Et je voudrais juste euh, finir par euh, euh, des choses encore plus affectives. Donc, euh, je n'ai gardé qu'un seul dessin de Deodinck dans ma collection, c'est celui que vous voyez à gauche, mais en fait, là. Euh, euh, c'est un dessin sur une enveloppe où euh, le peintre a dédicacé à son fils, enfin, envoyé la lettre à son fils, donc on lit à Monsieur Alfred de Odin, fils. Suivante. Et puis avec le temps, donc c'est un rapport du père au fils, et puis avec le temps, ben, on, je tombe sur cette fameuse lettre, peut-être que vous la connaissez, la lettre de Danvo, c'est une drôle d'histoire, parce que Danvo, donc, à son papa qui travaille très peu, qui ne gagne pas sa vie, donc il, il fait sous-traiter l'écriture d'une lettre un peu calligraphiée par son père, et donc euh, le montant qu'on qu paye de la lettre, je ne sais plus si c'est 500 ou 1000 euros, donc est écrite par son père, mais surtout l'histoire que raconte la lettre est un, un, un garçon qui écrit à son père qui va à la guerre et qui va donc mourir, et qui voilà, il le prévient qu'il va mourir. Et puis j'arrive à Tel Aviv, suivante. Et puis là, euh, donc, excusez-moi pour la qualité de l'image, mais je, il y a une troisième image qui, qui vient se joindre aux deux précédentes avec un artiste israélien photographe, Yossi Breger, où cette fois-ci, euh, Yossi Breger, qui est, euh, qui est un, un photographe connu en Israël, donc euh, euh, trouve dans, dans les affaires de son père décédé donc une Bible qu'il lui a offerte quand il a fait sa communion, ce qu'on dit la bar mitzvah euh, dans la tradition juive. Et donc, euh, il lui écrit euh, cette dédicace, donc toujours cette liaison euh, entre le père et le fils. Voilà. Merci beaucoup. Um, so I, I'm not sure that uh, everybody knows um, what the Morgan Library is, so I thought I would um, uh, introduce very briefly the place. Um, it's, um, uh, at its core is the collection of the banker uh, J.P. Morgan, um, who was a um, major financier and um, wealthiest man in America, probably at the end of the 19th century, begin, beginning of the 20th century. And he collected everything, but especially he was interested in books and manuscripts and drawings. And he had a library built. So on the left is um, the Pierre Morgan Library, as um, it was built in 1906 by uh, the architect Charles McKim. This is, I mean, it's a bigger, uh, group of buildings, but this is the library itself with the books. And then um, what it is now uh, on the right is uh, an extension that was built by Renzo Piano in, and which opened in 2006, which has expanded um, the, the institution with also more galleries, etc. So the, the collection um, until recently was primarily books, manuscripts and old master drawings. And um, and um, the um, here is just uh, to represent some you know an aspect of it. Uh, um, we have an extraordinary collection of medieval manuscripts, and um, we also have drawings from the Renaissance to. Again, until about 10 years ago, it was until it would go up to about Cézanne. So here's Durer and Pontormo and Turner, um, about maybe 12,000 sheets. 
Um, and about 10 years ago, um, that is at the time when the building was also expanded and renovated by a contemporary architect, obviously, it was decided that um, there was no reason to stop collecting drawings with Cezanne and that um, we should continue representing the history of drawing up to today. And it's at that point that the position for a curator of modern and contemporary drawings was created. And that's when I arrived at the Morgan. So, so what I'm going to show is how um, in this context, uh, uh, we have tried to build a collection of modern and contemporary drawings. Um, one of the first uh, exhibitions I did um, was to invite four contemporary artists to select drawings from the collection, from the old master collection, uh, that we presented next to some of their drawings. Uh, the idea, of course, was immediately to, um, maybe in a way to reassure a lot of people that uh, there is nothing wrong with collecting modern drawings, even if the institution was traditionally associated with old masters, and that, in fact, um, contemporary artists um, look a lot at old master drawings, and also that uh, contemporary art influenced the way everybody uh, looks and interprets uh, old master drawings. So one of the artists was Baslitz, so um, Baslitz immediately uh, chose to um, show drawings by Parmigianino. As you may know, he's a fanatic of ma Italian mannerism. So here's one of the, one of the pairings we did. Um, Uh, another artist was Ellsworth Kelly, um, who chose variety of drawings. And as you see, he actually made specific pairings with some of his drawings. Uh, at the top um, with a Vato, and uh, at the bottom with an Ingres. Okay, I'll do that. This one. Perfect. And another one was Penone, um, who is also, you know, very interested in old master drawings in general. And uh, when we went through the boxes uh, in the storage, he saw this drawing by Ribera of a man attached to a tree. So, of course, he was immediately uh, really excited by it and included it, among others, in the exhibition. And um, here's another pairing with Penone. And I have to say the drawing on the right, uh, the imprint, which is part of a series, which was shown at the drawing center actually, uh, around the fingerprints, um, is the first drawing that we purchased um, as for the collection um, in 2006 or seven, um, a, a main contemporary drawing. Um, and um, then another, um, Another um, exhibition I wanted to mention here is uh, um, which shows that uh, contemporary artists um, are uh, sometimes more interested than we think uh, about uh, the old masters. Is uh, I was working on Dan Flavin, and of course you know his um, fluorescent light installations. Uh, he is uh, he was. Um, fascinated by drawing, he would draw all the time. But what I discovered when I was working on it is that he collected 19th century um, drawings, American drawings from the Hudson School River. And so in the exhibition, the last uh, room of the exhibition was an installation and was a, a selection of uh, 19th century drawings from the collection of Dan Flavin. So here you may not see very well, but on one side are some of his drawings and on the other side, uh, the 19th century. It may be of course relevant that uh, he collected primarily a movement called Luminism, <laughs> but I don't think it was really um, the main point was he was interested in drawings with where with very little, very few marks you create a strong effect, which is what he was trying to do with his sculptures. Um, and then, um, then what I wanted to say is that um, I wasn't sure in, in talking about building a collection if we wanted to talk about sort of practical aspect, how do we <laughs> acquire drawings when, of course I should have said we didn't have much of a budget to do it. Um, so the, the program of exhibitions was very important in that sense and this is something Michael Zem talked about earlier, you create those relationship with artists, with collectors, with the heirs of artists, and that helps building the collection. So one of the um, first monographic exhibitions that we did, or actually that we took, because it was an, an exhibition organized in Europe um, by Michael Zampf um, on Philip Guston, 
and uh, as a result, uh, from we got one drawing um, uh, as a gift from the daughter of Philip Guston. That's the self-portrait on the or untitled but on the right. And um, a collector whom I met uh, during the time of the exhibition uh, when I was preparing, and I added her drawing to the exhibition. And then it turned out I found out after she died that she actually bequeathed that drawing to the Morgan. So we got another Guston uh, as a result. In in fact, of the exhibition. Um, Albert's, another exhibition, uh, also organized with museums in Europe um, of the studies. And again, after the exhibition, we were able to uh, receive as a gift one of the drawings, uh, one of those studies. I'm sorry, the colors are not terribly good in the projection. Um, Another uh, exhibition I did was on Roy Lichtenstein's uh, The Black and White Drawings, and that also led to uh, gifts of uh, one uh, a drawing by Roy Lichtenstein, one of the small pop drawings from the early 60s, but also because of the relationship we established with Dorothy Lichtenstein, the widow, um, she uh, a couple of years ago, decided to give us drawings by other artists that Roy Lichtenstein had collected. And so it was a small group of works, but uh, quite a um, wonderful group uh, of drawings by Andy Warhol, Cy Twombly, Bryce Marden, Bruce Nauman, Klaus Oldenburg, etc. As, as you see, those are artists that we can't really buy because their market is so high. So it was a really wonderful gift that also came... Um, uh, out of doing an exhibition. Um, and then sometimes we have acquired things uh, that we purchased, but in conjunction with doing exhibitions to build around things we had. Um, the uh, One of the big, big benefactors of the Morgan is uh, Eugene Thor, who was a dealer, now mostly a collector, collect also old masters, or maybe primarily, but also modern, and has been involved with the catalog raisonné of Jackson Pollock. And so he had given the Morgan two drawings by Jackson Pollock. So we had already uh, uh, something to talk about surrealism in the 40s. And then uh, we got the Richard Pousset dart from the same time from the foundation. And then about the same time then, um, I bought two other drawings, um, the André Masson, which we bought at the Salon du Dessin, the Salon, the, the one at La Bourse, um, and then re more recently, a Mexican surrealist, Gunter Gerzo. So this is just to indicate how in acquiring, you see, it's not like we are trying to fill gaps because the whole thing is a gap. I mean, <laughs> so um, we, we try to build maybe around, you know, groups around things we have and uh, to have those little nucleus um, and so this was the series. Another thing that we keep in mind is that we, we are, after all, also, also a library. So it's always interesting when we can connect uh, drawings to books, to literary works. And so we had the chance of the, this is a purchase also, the Balthus uh, study for Wuthering Heights, a very early Balthus, but beautiful drawing. Uh, or on the right, um, uh, drawing by Larry Rivers with the poet Frank O'Hara, which was a sketch for a series of prints they did. Um, and then um, another, uh, I should say that then another way to acquire drawings has been to form a collector's committee. And the few remaining slides, I think, are mostly drawings that I was able to buy with this, uh, with this committee. I present drawings to them every year, and they choose which one they buy. Um, they, they, to be on the committee, they have to give money. <laughs> this is America, remember. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, we, we bought this Robert Overby. Um, as you will see, I, I tried to find, obviously, artists who, who are important. Usually, they, they, are, they already have a place in art history, but they are not very high on the market. So that's really the basic strategy. So Robert Overby is one of them. And here's a wonderful uh, frottage of a wall, a kitchen wall, um, which I'm placing here with an early frottage by Max Ernst, which we had in the collection as an earlier gift. Um, uh, and here, uh, I'm always, of course, keen on finding ways to connect the contemporary drawings to old masters. On the left is Kim Jones, uh, an artist known more for his performances, uh, mostly things um, uh, inspired by his traumatic experience in Vietnam in the 60s, and he uh, has made lots of works where he transformed himself into mudman. 
and here you see the figure in the middle of the drawing is Mudman, but as you see, there are lots of reference to Rembrandt, Picasso, to Tiepolo, so it's very, um, it's, it's a mix of styles, in fact. Um, and the Christophilie, uh, that was a drawing I saw um, at the Armory show a few years ago, and uh, at first I had no idea who made it, and then I realized it was an Ophelie, it's a very early Ophelie, and I thought it was so interesting because you see here directly how he was interested in Schiele and Kokoschka and the Vienna Secession, which of course gives you an indication where all of the decorative aspects of his paintings come from. Um, Women's, uh, women's art in general is cheaper, so we look a lot at the art by women. Um, a beautiful Nancy Sparrow, an artist who is definitely underrated. I mean, she's, she's just fabulous. So uh, we bought this drawing from the 60s, and on the right, uh, Susan Rothenberg. Um, and I'm wrapping it up so you have enough time. <laughs> uh, per Kirkeby, an artist not very well known in the United States, better known now, uh, I mean, because he, has, he had an exhibition at the Tate a few years ago, uh, but this is a great example of his um, um, sort of forest or nature-inspired abstractions from the 80s, and um, yeah. And then um, Al Taylor, an artist uh, whose drawings are just so fabulous, but who is not so well known and whose market is not so high. He died young, so that's probably a reason. And uh, so here is one of the fantastic uh, drawings from the Peabody group. Um, I won't go too much into it, but basically it's based on the um, uh, dog pee that he would uh, observe on the sidewalk um, and then he does this with uh, with his paint and then he gives names of dogs to each uh, stain or each rivulet of uh, paint. Um, and another a wonderful group by Rosemary Trockel um, of two drawings which I thought were also very interesting because they relate to botanical drawings so also to uh, tradition. I'm not necessarily trying to build a collection of drawings that relate to old masters but uh, very often you, you end up finding those connections. Um, also uh, extending a little bit the idea of drawing, this is a solely with folded sheets so the, the drawing is in the folds um, and uh, different types of traces also. Uh, the Vitello speaker drawing done by putting pigments in speakers and then you know, playing the music and I mean putting a sheet on over the speaker and then uh, obtaining the drawing that way. Or Gavin Turk putting his sheet of paper behind the, the exhaust pipe of his van and starting the van and creating those uh, drawings. Um, and in a different way, artists uh, who are more contemporary but with techniques that are more traditional, uh, Art Schwager, those potatoes that you could look in the, uh, in the tradition of uh, Chardin's uh, uh, pillar of potatoes or um, Van Gogh, uh, the potato eaters. And uh, Neil Gall, who makes little sculptures in uh, so some sort of Play-Doh, and then makes those extraordinary drawings, uh, large drawings from it. So it's sort of an insignificant subject, but a very detailed, refined drawing. Um, I think I'll skip this. Uh, Anne-Marie Schneider and Steve Di Benedetto, and I was going to end with two self-portraits uh, to show this is an important tradition, but which uh, you see in contemporary art. With Maria Lasnik, this scientific self-portrait where she covers herself with all sorts of uh, um, devices, like to read electrodes and stuff. And or the Skippenberger represents himself as um, in the guise of a um, mascot for a hardware store in Arizona, uh, with a lot of humor. Thank you, Isabel. Um, so I'm going to present now a collection that was built, as I mentioned, by funding from the Art Fund in the UK uh, between the Drawing Center and Middlesbrough, MIMA, an institution that's near Newcastle. Um, actually, it's a little bit of a funny story. On the second or third day as director of the Drawing Center, I got a call from a colleague 
uh, who had just recently become the director of MEMA, who I had met when I was at uh, PS1. And he said for six or eight months, he'd been trying to reach someone at the drawing center, and he really wanted to collaborate with our institution on a, putting together um, a proposal for the art fund. And I said to him that I would talk to my board. I mean, we're not an institution that buys or collects. Um, actually, we were kind of founded against uh, the idea of collecting in general by Martha Beck when she resigned from MoMA. Um, and we did have a conversation at the board level. And it was a pretty interesting conversation. I mean, of course, no one had ever heard of Middlesbrough, uh, not exactly the center of the UK. Um, it wasn't London. Um, but nonetheless, um, we talked about why the Drawing Center at this point in its time uh, frame in terms of its historical uh, life as an institution, we were nearing about 35 years, uh, might want to engage in building a collection with another institution. Um, and it turned out that we did go ahead, uh, and Godfried, uh, who was the director at the time, um, put the application in, and lo and behold, uh, the Drawing Center in MIMA won a million British pounds from the Art Fund to begin buying drawings uh, in 2008. Just to be clear that the Art Fund's um, premise was that all of the works that are purchased from the Art Fund have to be non-British works of art. So works of art that are coming from outside of the UK um, and generally should fill gaps in collections like at the Tate or the National Portrait Gallery. So our remit was, and the proposal that we put forward was originally North American, particularly American drawings. Later, we expanded the remit to be South America as well. Um, I think the basis for the collection was as follows. Um, Godfrey uh, and I and Gavin Delahunty, who I mentioned before, who was uh, the curator at MIMA, sat down in London for a couple of days of meetings after we had won the prize. And one of the things that we talked about, and we did look very closely at the Tate's database um, in terms of what they had in, in contemporary works in drawing. Um, and what we realized was that in order to tell the story of drawing from what we were actually making an argument that maybe the first contemporary drawing was the Erased to Kooning by Rauschenberg, and to really try to understand that as the beginning uh, of the contemporary uh, drawing world, I mean, encoded in that drawing might be all of the issues that we're still dealing with today, uh, that we couldn't make what I would call a Noah's Ark collection. Um, we weren't going to buy one uh, Ed Ruscha and one Jasper Johns and one Ellsworth Kelly. This was not going to be the right way to build a collection for this institution. Um, what we did decide is that we would look at planks. We'd look at four or five different areas. Um, and the areas that we really focused on, and these are not necessarily totally uh, exhaustive, there were other areas that we did look at, were the relationship between drawing and sculpture, particularly around earth art and art that couldn't be made uh, in the materials that the artists were drawing in. So for instance, I'll show you some works by Stephen Antonakis, uh, where he was drawing very large scale neon sculptures that just couldn't be fabricated at the time. Um, the idea of drawn language, uh, the relationship between uh, language and writing, uh, sorry, uh, language, writing, and drawing. Um, the relationships between drawing and media. So for instance, uh, the work of the artist Robert Breer. Um, we ended up buying the film 66 and all the index cards that made the film. So that was a kind of example of how we might look at that. And then of course collages drawing, which is not necessarily a new idea, but it was an idea that we wanted to kind of trace um, in this collection. So first, uh, drawing and sculpture, uh, the first image is of the Stephen Antonakis. Um, we ended up, uh, by the way, as, as best as we could, we tried to visit all of the artists and talk to them personally if they were alive. Uh, and before we bought a work for the collection, we also really wanted to explain how we were building this collection to the artists. And in some cases, the artists provided us with works that were never even available on the commercial market. You can also understand that um, in 2008, after the financial collapse, um, a million British pounds went pretty far. Um, it was a good moment to be in the, in the marketplace, and we were very lucky because there were many artists who were excited uh, to help us to build this collection for this institution in the UK. In any case, this is a drawing from 1968, and it turns out that from Stephen Antonakis, we ended up buying a suite of about six drawings uh, from this period of time, uh, which included sometimes language, this kind of smudged uh, element. Uh, he was drawing these very quickly, and these were really kind of maquettes in a way for potential neon sculptures, which again, just could not be built in 1968. 
um, a work that we bought uh, by Michael Heiser, um, which is called Lunar Interference, Landscape Int Intrusive Depression, 1969. Um, this piece is pretty unique in Heiser's output because many of Heiser's drawings have markings in terms of scale, but this one has no scale. So you don't know whether or not you're looking at something that's 15 feet or 25 miles. Um, and I think what was interesting for us was the idea that, again, Heiser, Di Maria, um, many of the artists who were working with earth art and land art in the late 60s had to turn to drawing to really be the way that they could primarily express their ideas. Um, because other than, let's say, Virginia Dwan and some galleries and maybe patrons who were interested in this kind of work, they really couldn't physically make the work. I mean, the only thing that they had were the drawings or sometimes collages of the work. Uh, Lee Bontecu, um, this was a kind of interesting story. Um, I ended up meeting with Lee several times. Um, it was a little bit complex. Lee is not the easiest artist to talk to or to meet. Um, she presented me with this one drawing from 1975, uh, which at the time she was working with Nodler. And um, we had a long discussion about this drawing, and I really felt that this was a, a pretty fantastic drawing, very important in her work. Uh, and I presented this to the art fund, and they rejected it. Um, and we had to go back, and I had to really think about that. Um, they, we, we presented more than 125 works. In the end, uh, 93 works were accepted into the collection, so there were some works that were not accepted into uh, the collection because the art fund had to vet them. Uh, but this one, I decided that I would go to the mat and I would go back to the art fund. I mean, their argument was, well, why don't you buy a soot drawing? And I said, well, we'd love to, but they're not available and they would probably blow our whole budget for the rest of, you know, all the rest of the works that we could buy. And I felt that this drawing was really very important um, at a good moment in Lee's career. And we kind of recalibrated our argument to the art fund. And in the second round, uh, fortunately, it was accepted and we were able to purchase the piece. Uh, James Lee Byers, um, so we bought several works of James Lee Byers, uh, this one a kind of folded um, ink on gold paper. Uh, we, these are hung kind of in um, various configurations and we were able to install this uh, on the wall very high up at NEMA when we installed the first half of the show there. Um, this was from 1994. I mean, with James Lee Byers, we were also interested in maybe the performative nature of the work itself, but also the fact that the work operated like a sculpture. It could be placed uh, in the context of sculpture. Um, a very beautiful Fred Sandback drawing, um, untitled 1987, uh, in which it's a little difficult to see it on the slide, but um, essentially it's two pieces of vellum with a channel in the middle and then um, a pastel uh, drawn in between the vellum that has like a little bit of a fuzzy, almost active nature. So it really feels like string. Um, it has a beautiful texture and physicality to it. And um, for me, this was again, a kind of way in which drawing could act as a form of sculptural thinking. Um, I think for Sandbeck, uh, th this work would be somewhere in between an installation uh, and a drawing. Uh, also, Al Taylor. Um, we also kind of, you know, came to Al Taylor's work. Um, I like Al Taylor a lot. I spent a lot of time with Debbie Taylor, uh, you know, talking about Al's work, and we ended up buying some works that were um, the barcode works from 1993. Um, for me, if I was going to do a show of Al Taylor's works of, uh, works on paper, I would kind of call it in-between things. My sense was that Al's work was always really about sculpture, but he used drawing as the way to move from one project to the next. And so um, I really like this series because it, it presages a, a body of work that was in sculpture and also refers to the previous body of work that he had made uh, probably in 92. Um, and I think the drawings act as that kind of bridge in between, and so this was the second drawing. Um, drawing in media, uh, again, as I mentioned, the Robert Breer, um, 19, uh, the 66 film, and the 24 original four by six index cards that made the film. Um, you know, for me, it's important also in contemporary drawing to think about the relationship of uh, media to drawing. I mean, direct filmmaking, stop motion animation, uh, all of these things. I mean, if you look at the work of William Kentridge, uh, many other artists are kind of using these technologies. And I think for us, we were kind of intrigued in a broad way, um, Breer being a kind of direct form of this. 
Um, however, an artist like Nathan Carter, a younger artist who was using the idea of information networks, um, signals, transmissions, uh, as another way of thinking about the relationship of drawing and media. This piece is called The JFK Tower Mist Approach. We're in the clouds over 2005. Um, and it's a collage, pencil, acrylic, and paint. Uh, Paul Sharitz, uh, some of you may know his work in structural film. Um, there was a series of uh, shows that had been done at Green Naftali, and these drawings I thought were really spectacular. Um, we ended up buying about four of them uh, from that exhibition. And for me, Sharitz really represented, again, a kind of notational, schematic way of thinking about time and, and maybe even shape and color in filmic work. Again, this is really something that is directly related to his work in media. Uh, Jack Witten's uh, work that he made uh, in relationship to the IBM uh, Xerox residency that he had in 1972-73. Um, these works are actually made in 74. Um, him, Agnes Dennis, uh, I can't remember who the other, Bob Whitman, and there was one other artist who uh, had a Xerox residency. Um, Jack said that basically they gave him a Xerox machine and an access to a technician. And he decided that he wasn't interested in the Xerox machine, he was only interested in the, um, the actual Xerox carbon. So he would break open those carbon uh, boxes and then he was making basically Xerox carbon drawings um, by frottage and rubbing things very much like the way that he worked with his paintings. And again, I thought that in relationship technology and, and the idea of media, if you want to think of a Xerox machine as a form of media, um, that these works were quite interesting. Another one, um, very beautiful in, in their kind of abstract format. Um, this is a, actually a lithograph, so not necessarily a drawing, but we were interested in Bob Gober's work. And I think for me, Gober's prints do act in the, the area of drawing. I mean, he's obviously looking at a lot of um, newspapers, and sometimes there have been drawn elements on these prints. Um, this was an untitled lithograph, but what it is, it's a little um, f uh, figure of actually a drawn cartoon that Gober has drawn inside of an other newspaper articles. Um, and then you can see it a little bit more clearly there. So this idea of a drawing inside of a print in a newspaper. So where does illustration, how does kind of, you know, th th that, that almost regressive, triple regress of where does the drawing exist in this work? And then lastly, uh, collages drawing, uh, Paul Chan was an artist who we were interested both on the media side of our equation, but also on the uh, collage side of the equation. And this was a set of drawings that, that we bought from Paul, uh, untitled 2007. It was a set of seven drawings uh, with charcoal. And in some cases, like Paul Chan, you know, sometimes we were able to check two boxes with one series. Um, I think in this case, uh, Paul's work and these were later turned into animated films. Um, so, you know, the, or at least some of these figures appeared in later animated films that he did. So I would put him in the camp again of the kind of media uh, as well. Um, Ellsworth Kelly, uh, Gavin uh, had a very good relationship with Ellsworth. We went up to visit him. Uh, in 2010, and um, he pulled out a couple of early collages that uh, Matthew Marks did not have uh, for sale. Um, we looked at many, many things, but we were particularly interested in the early collages from 57, um, and we ended up purchasing three collages from Ellsworth uh, from that period of time. And I think that those were an important kind of early um, sorry, early, the earliest pieces in the collection that we were able to buy. There were some works that were earlier, which were the Warhol um, uh, kind of uh, double-sided uh, drawings, ink blot drawings and, and other drawings that were made in 47 to 53. But sadly, the art fund, and that's one fight I did not lose, um, rejected all of the drawings that I presented from the Warhol estate. Uh, during that period of time. I think that they felt that somehow uh, they were too tied to his work in illustration, although I still would make the argument and continue to make the argument that you can't really understand Warhol without looking at that body of work. So I'm sad that, that the Mima collection did not start there, but it starts with Ellsworth, and I think uh, that's a good place to begin. Um, we bought a maquette uh, from 
Barbara Kruger. And um, I was, again, interested in this relationship of graphic design, collage, what is this? Um, you know, Barbara would call these uh, essentially drawings. Um, and we were kind of intrigued with some of the handwriting and also the registration marks uh, that were on this uh, collage. Uh, the Kara Walker collage from 2006. Um, we were interested in Kara's work, obviously. Uh, actually, oddly, uh, the Tate had none of Kara's work in their collection. So she was an artist that we began talking to very early on. It took a while for us to find a piece that we could uh, agree on that, that also made sense within this collection. Um, and we liked these works that were uh, actually shown at the Met at one point um, and that were kind of based on uh, scenes of flooding in New Orleans and um, had they had a kind of emotional impact that Kara's work had uh, maybe without the giant scale. And then drawn language, um, this is a pretty broad category but we would start with um, a piece by Adrian Piper which is called Hypothesis Situation Number 7 which included a photo diagram collage, vintage photo offset, and original carbon copy. Um, these are a set of three um, pieces and a triptych. And again, here, um, unfortunately, it's a little hard to see, but there are hand-drawn lines that are connecting photos that she's taken of TV shows. And the hy hypothetical or hy uh, hypothesis situations are quite well documented in the text, which you can't really read in the picture. But nonetheless, um, it's, it's a kind of relationship of the analyzation, analysis of, of mass media. Um, at the time in 1968, and if you know Adrian's work, it's a very heavily political uh, piece, and it was a quite interesting acquisition. Um, has anyone ever tried to purchase a, a work by Adrian Piper? Um, you, you, the contract that Adrian has is maybe the most complicated contract. It's from the um, Art Workers Coalition, uh, and I would say that it, in, it, in and of itself as an artist contract, it, it is a work of art. Um, it's really a kind of an amazing uh, document. Um, we were able to buy a Glenn Ligon, uh, the study for Negro Sunshine uh, uh, 2, number 17 from 2010. Um, we were surely interested, and I've worked with Glenn on a couple of occasions and other projects. Um, I think for Glenn drawing plays an important role, um, but here I was more interested in, again, his relationship to language uh, and particularly literature, which is a very, very important and foundational part of how he thinks. Um, the Robert Smithson pop drawings are probably my favorite things that we purchased, um, and we got these quite early. Uh, this is from 1962. I mean, these were probably the second or third things that we bought in 2008. Um, now the pop drawings are kind of having a third and fourth life um, in New York, but at the time, um, they hadn't really been well exhibited. Uh, they were really quite radical, totally bizarre for Smithson. Uh, and again, with all of this text and kind of illustration, um, we felt that this was a really important uh, thing to have. And not only that, um, it, it showed a whole other side of Smithson uh, and, and his relationship to drawing uh, early on uh, that was kind of unparalleled. I mean, it was, you know, it was something that I thought could be very important in a collection like this. Um, the last couple of works, uh, Guillermo Cuitka's People on Fire, Mixed Media on Paper. Um, you know, Guillermo doesn't really draw, however, he does make a lot of works uh, on paper. Um, this is uh, a work that's a flowchart. Um, obviously, some of his earlier works, this was done in 2002, but kind of looking at uh, literature, um, often he was looking at maps, he was looking at the political situation in Argentina anyway, um, and we thought that this was a kind of nice way of bringing Guillermo into the collection uh, and to understand how drawing operated in his own practice. Uh, Nancy Spiro as well. Um, I'm a big fan of Nancy's work, and um, we bought a piece uh, from the Arto series from 1969, uh, actually several works, and that included text as well. And I think that then covers uh, the collection for MIMA. I did want to mention that the nice thing about the MIMA collection is as follows. Um, the deal that we made was if the Drawing Center ever wants to borrow these works, that we would get first crack at being able to borrow them back if we had a show. Um, we have put together with MIMA several um, 
collection shows for their venue. We continue to actually collaborate with the institution, although the, that institution has gone through some changes. And the, the best part about it is in the UK, MEMA now is a place where other institutions are coming and borrowing these 80 or 90 works that we've collected. Um, so they've really had a very deep circulation and even the Tate is coming to MEMA and borrowing the Kara Walker that they don't have. So I think in a way it was a very interesting exercise, uh, not only in the specifics of the UK context, but for me as an exercise, I've only worked in Kunsthalles or fabrication spaces, so my context is really not about building a museum collection, but it offered me an opportunity to really think through um, my own institution's history and about what it would be that we would do if the drawing center was to engage in building a collection, um, but we were able to do it virtually, and in some ways I get the best of all the worlds. I was able to spend the money, but I don't actually have to do any conservation or support of the work after that. Someone else now can put them in their drawers and worry about it, but in that sense, um, from as an intellectual process, it was really quite fantastic. So. Um, now what I'd like to do is maybe just turn to the other panelists. We have a couple of more minutes, um, and if there are any observations or comments uh, that we might have. I mean, there are a couple of things I wanted to mention. Uh, Dr. Cohn, I mean, you know, there, there is a, a funny connection of dentists and, and artists. Um, I actually happen to know some dentists in New York that have traded a lot of uh, dental work for artwork. Um, so maybe there's a whole, there should be a special museum of the relationship between dentists and artists. Uh, but I was gonna say that what I liked about your presentation, and I think it's very important, is the idea of friendship. Um, I think it seems that in some core aspects of what you did, it was really about your relationship with the artists, and also that kind of organic way in which you build the connections. So you buy one piece that's about the relationship between an artist and his father, and now you have three, and maybe in the end you might have 30. Or maybe you stop there, and then you find something else. So I think that's interesting. Most collectors are very focused on other ways of thinking. Well, exactly. I will switch in, in French, okay? okay? Sorry. Um, oui, c'est exactement ça. And you, you, vous avez parlé du dessin de Erase the Conic Drawing by uh, Rochenberg. Et ça, c'est... C'est une œuvre, quand j'ai découvert ça, il n'y a pas si longtemps, il y a une dizaine d'années, ça m'a énormément marqué en termes d'histoire de, de l'art. Évidemment, le geste est incroyable. Alors, vous voyez, j'aurais pu faire la connexion souvent à partir d'une œuvre, une photo, une installation et trouver le dessin. Mais là, c'est l'inverse. Et le dessin m'a amené à collectionner une œuvre sonore de Mario Garcia Torres, pour ceux qui la connaissent, Mario Garcia Torres, qui est connu pour un artiste post-conceptuel qui se réapproprie euh, souvent euh, les œuvres des autres. Donc euh, j'ai trouvé une, une œuvre incroyable où on, on passe dans, dans un couloir ou dans l'exposition et vous entendez juste le, le frottement du dessin donc euh, qui s'efface et ça c'est incroyable donc c'est pas toujours dans le sens euh, on trouve l'œuvre et puis le dessin mais là c'est le dessin qui m'a amené à, à collectionner une œuvre euh, voilà So Isabel I, you know it's interesting I, I guess I didn't realize how young the Morgan collection was I mean you you started at the Morgan in 2006 yeah, or 2005, okay, so I became director of the Drawing Center in April of 2007. Um, for some reason, I thought that maybe it was a little bit longer than that, but I mean, it's been about 12 years, 13 years now. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the, I don't want to say struggles, but I mean, obviously, you know, you, you have um, a situation where you have a young, new department um, embedded in an institution that, of course, has been very heavy, as you've mentioned, with illustrated manuscripts and old master work. I think it was interesting, and you've been very honest also with us about, you know, budget and, and constraints. Um, but how do you see that collection moving forward now in terms of some of the roots that you've planted um, in making the relationships between the works that you're purchasing and old master work? But are there other things that you're looking at that you would like to develop I mean, if money was no object, I mean, let's, let's just say, you know, that is the basis. Well, I mean, we are just beginning, and the, the idea is that the collection as it was, the collection of old master drawings, is represents really the history of drawing from the beginning, you know, from the early Renaissance to a certain point. So we were continuing. So that's why one of the criteria was... Um, 
for the drawings we purchase or acquire, whichever way, um, does it has a, does it have a place? If if we wanted to do a history of drawing in the 20th century or 21st century, what would we include? So that was a bit like this. So it's not the idea of collecting in depth a particular artist or since, of course, we are not MoMA or the Met, we don't need to relate to a painting or a sculpture, you know. It's really about the history of the medium. And um, I don't really try to spend too much time defining what is drawing. Um, Neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> because then, you know, um, mostly they are on paper, but not necessarily. We bought a Jim Dine that is uh, charcoal and felt, so... Um, and I had no problem. Uh, I figure I... If I think it's a drawing, it's a drawing. <laughs> and um, so the idea is to continue along that. I mean, there are so many so many gaps, as I was saying, if we wanted to really have a sense of the different aspects of the creation in drawing throughout the modern period. So that's that's how we are trying to continue now, yeah. But are you, would you take an approach where you would like to tell a different story about, you know, modern drawing. I mean, you know, it, just to, so to counterpoint, like the way that we kind of looked at Mima, you know, starting with Rauschenberg. I mean, we took a, a little bit of a contrarian approach, although the planks might be planks that you might also want to follow in terms of the way that you were collecting. Um, surely drawn language might be something that the Morgan would be very interested in, and you might already be doing that. Um, but I guess my question yes. is, is there something that, a story that you would like to tell about contemporary and modern work as you've been at the, the Morgan now for more than a decade, ideas that you're seeing that you would like to further develop? Um, not at the moment, not, not, dif not differently from what I've been trying to do mm -hmm. it because in, in the history of modern drawings, you already have so many aspects that are so different from the old masters uh, and which makes it you know, difficult vis-a-vis -vis a number of members of our board, for instance, who just don't understand how you can buy drawing, you know, the Nancy Sparrow or the, I mean, yeah. <laughs> the comments you hear. It, it's, you have to remember the Morgan is a conservative institution. <laughs> so you start already with um, just, um, even if you take a sort of standard history of drawing in the 20th century, it's already difficult to get that in. So I'm not really trying to find a different kind of history of drawing. Uh, who knows, with the 21st century, it might develop might differently, change. but yeah. I'm going to open this up to any questions from the audience. Does anyone want to ask any of the participants or myself any, th any questions about what we've talked about or things that we're thinking about in the future? No questions at all? Okay, then I think the last question that I'm going to ask um, would be, how do you define a great drawing? So we'll start with Dr. Cohn. Oh, you, you're not, you want to pass on that one? <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> one surprise question per... I, I think, well, the notion of surprise is good. I think a great drawing um, is... You, sort of you know it when you see it, not necessarily immediately, but if you look at a work, uh, it, because it will be not only in, you know, the, the drawings, but in your reaction to it, because you know so many drawings you've seen, so many. Um, I notice always that walking, for instance, in a fair, you know, you walk and you see, oh, it's kind of the same, or it's, and suddenly you stop, because suddenly there was something different. And then you start exploring why and all. So it, it's hard to, I mean, I don't think you can say it would have that, that, and that, you know. It's really in, a, it stands out. After a while, you can probably determine why, but not necessarily. So I think uh, you recognize the great drawings in your reactions to it. Well, from the point of view of a collection of private, I think a un grand dessin ou une œuvre qui nous paraît importante, c'est une œuvre qui ne sort pas de notre esprit. C'est-à-dire que vous la voyez une fois, puis vous y pensez, et puis vous réveillez le lendemain, vous y pensez encore, vous, vous réveillez encore une fois. Et, et là, euh, depuis hier soir, je vois un dessin d'une artiste que je ne suis pas, qui s'appelle Agnès Turnower, bon, que je connaissais de nom. Et puis, euh, 
le, je reviens revoir ce dessin et je redemande le prix et, et le galeriste me dit mais vous savez ça fait trois fois que vous me demandez le prix de ce, de ce dessin en, en l'espace donc de quelques heures entre hier soir et puis l'heure du déjeuner quoi. alors je lui raconte que tout simplement euh, je regardais ce dessin et j'étais assez scotché parce qu'il y a, a 10-15 ans je racontais une histoire par rapport à mon implication par rapport au musée de Jérusalem avec, euh, avec Marcel Broutars, avec Absalon, euh, avec André Cadéré, euh, des artistes qui m'ont toujours fasciné. Et je retrouve tout ce que j'ai raconté dans ce dessin. Et je raconte ça au galeriste et l'artiste était derrière moi et me dit « Mais c'est assez incroyable parce que les trois noms que vous citez m'ont amené à faire cette œuvre. Donc voilà, c'est ça ce que j'appelle, c'est des, vraiment des belles rencontres et, et j'appelle ça, enfin, pour un collectionneur privé, l'essentiel, il est là. Enfin, est... I'm going to answer the question. I'm, I was listening to the end of Dr. Kohn's uh, answer. You know, it, it's interesting, I've been giving a lot of thought to this um, Maybe because recently I feel I've been accused of not being able to, or you know, not not knowing the difference between a great drawing and a not not a great drawing. Um, but I guess that one of the interesting things about working with drawing is that when you have to work with drawings, you, the volume of work that you have to look through to build a show. I mean, I've worked with artists where I've had to look at 3,000 works on paper, you know, to put a show together of 80 or 90 works. Um, You know, for me, I'd also agree with you, Isabel, that it is a kind of gut feeling. Um, you know, my values and what makes a drawing great are not necessarily the same as probably what would be the traditional way of looking at drawing. Finely rendered work, um, detail, skill, those are, play a role, and I'm surely not against beautiful drawings. I mean, um, but I'm interested in things that talk to me about thinking, um, the kind of movement of ideas. Um, I, I'm a little less concerned about the poetics of the hand um, and this idea of mark making. Uh, so, you know, for me, a great drawing is going to tell me something about how an artist is thinking. Um, also, maybe how they're feeling, but um, it could be very, it could be a doodle, it could even be below a drawing. Um, and so, you know, f it, it is interesting that already we have three very subjective Um, viewpoints, uh, you know, I would say that um, I've been thinking a lot about my institution's role in contemporary drawing, and, you know, I, I mean, don't take this the wrong way, but maybe my role, our role, is not to show great drawings at the drawing center. You know, my sense is that maybe our role is to um, really ask questions about what this medium can be, how it's operating in contemporary culture, And, you know, I do also show older work as well. So I'm not, you know, I had a Bernini uh, from the Ecole de Beaux-Arts at the Drawing Center. I was thrilled to have a Bernini. It's a wonderful drawing in Soho. Um, it was fantastic. And, you know, that was a highlight of my career. I think that's a great drawing, you know, and I'm very happy to have it. But it, within, it had to be within the context of this other kind of exhibition exploring portraiture. So um, maybe that should wrap it up. Uh, and again, any questions before we complete? the talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cohn. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you all for coming.